Hi, I'm Jackie Stapleton and welcome to Atoll TV. If you've made it here, it means that you might just love ISO standards as much as me and you are truly interested and possibly even excited about learning more about them. Well, you've come to the right place. In this video, I'm going to cover clause 8.1, operational planning and control. I'm going to break this clause down and turn it into something you can all understand. You'll then be able to apply this to your own organization system and understand what the requirements will look like for you. No more guessing. Keep on watching as I can show you just how easy this is. Okay, let's get started. Let's take a look at what clause 8.1 wants us to do. First off, the clause states that the organization shall establish, implement, control, and maintain the processes needed to meet environmental management system requirements and to implement the actions identified in 6.1 and 6.2 by establishing operating criteria for the processes, implementing control of the processes in accordance with the operating criteria. This means that the organization needs to define how the processes will be carried out and the requirements that need to be met to ensure compliance with EMS requirements. They must also have measures in place to monitor and control the processes to ensure that they are being carried out as intended and to identify and address any non-conformities. By establishing and controlling these processes, the organization can ensure that they are meeting their environmental objectives and overall EMS commitments. There is a note after this section of the clause that states that controls can include engineering controls and procedures. Controls can be implemented following a hierarchy, example, elimination, substitution, administrative and can be used individually or in combination. This provides some guidance with regards to the types of controls you can consider. Elimination could be completely banning the use of a hazardous substance, whereas substitution would be replacing the hazardous substance with a safer one. Administrative controls include signage or training and PPE, which is considered a lower level control. Always consider elimination first, then substitution, and of course, administrative controls can be used in parallel with any other control. Then this clause goes on to state that, the organization shall control planned changes and review the consequences of unintended changes taking action to mitigate any adverse effects as necessary. So, of course things change and you will know about them as upcoming and plan to mitigate changes with new or different controls. Examples of planned changes could be the introduction of new products that have a reduced environmental impact, or the relocation of operations to a new site that has a varying environmental impact. Then of course, if there are unintended changes, which could be considered a non-conformance, then action is to be taken to deal with the consequences. I would suggest referring to clause 10.2, non-conformity and corrective action, to support the process of dealing with the consequences and implementing corrective actions for this. The clause then goes on to state that, the organization shall ensure that outsourced processes are controlled or influenced. The type and extent of control or influence to be applied to the processes shall be defined within the environmental management system. This simply means that if any activities, products or services are outsourced to contractors or subcontractors, that they still need to be controlled under the same banner and manner that all the others are. There is no exceptions if an outsourced party impacts the environmental management system. 
everyone is responsible. The next section of this course states that consistent with a life cycle perspective, the organization shall A, establish controls as appropriate to ensure that its environmental requirements are addressed in the design and development process for the product or service, considering each life cycle stage. B, determine its environmental requirements for the procurement of products and services as appropriate. This means that controls regarding the environmental impact need to be considered right from the beginning of the life cycle. Therefore, if you are responsible for the design and development of your product or service, then environmental impacts need to be considered at the design stage, as well as when purchasing any products and services for the provision of your own products. Then point C states to communicate its relevant environmental requirements to external providers, including contractors. So where you do have external providers, including contractors, it is important to communicate and make them aware of the environmental requirements relevant to the work that they are doing. This could be in their contract or agreement, and again, communicated at induction or onboarding prior to work commencing. Then D states, consider the need to provide information about potential significant environmental impacts associated with the transportation or delivery, use, end of life treatment, and final disposal of its products and services. And then to finish this life cycle for environmental impact, you need to consider the impacts from transportation or delivery of your products or services, as well as decommissioning or end of life, including how you or your customers can dispose of the product. To recap point A, design and development, point B, procurement of products and services, and point D, transport, delivery, use, and end of life through to disposal. All of these elements need to be considered when you determine the environmental impacts, which is managed in clause 612. I suggest you go back to clause 612 and with this new knowledge, review your environmental impacts. Then the absolute final part of this clause is that the organization shall maintain documented information to the extent necessary to have confidence that the processes have been carried out as planned. This means to help you to control and manage these requirements and the processes you develop to do this, these need to be documented written down and not just in your head. Now that I've explained all of these requirements, can you see more clearly how you could action and demonstrate these requirements in your own management system? Thank you so much for joining me. Clearly you are truly dedicated to learning more about ISO standards. I love having you learn with me and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Auditor Training Online is a recognized training provider and we know how it works in the real world. So we are confident that we can help you to make a change in your life and join the most sought after profession out there. Go to our website and enroll in our training to transform your work and industry experience into a recognized qualification and career. And also, don't forget to subscribe to Atoll TV and leave a comment or question as I truly do want to help you to join the best career out there with me.